Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Michael Garb, Chief Executive Officer of Youth and Family Enrichment Services, also known as WIFAS. In preparation for his transition to the nonprofit field, Michael served for 16 years on the boards of both the Family and Community Enrichment Services and Youth and Family Enrichment Services, which he also now leads. WIFAS is one of the largest and most respected nonprofit agencies in San Mateo County and provides a wide array of free and low-cost services to help over 34,000 children, youth, and adults each year who are dealing with substance abuse, violence, mental health, and other issues. Michael has generously agreed to share some of his experiences with us, and I'd like to thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. So, it's so fascinating to me that you move from this business career, you've, you've had your own businesses, you've been a senior, a senior executive at a number of different organizations and, and different types of organizations. You then generously donate your time for 16, or maybe 16 you can years. correct, 16 years, and then you make this, this incredible leap into the nonprofit uh, field. How, how did that work? What, what was your inspiration to first get involved in, in this work and then decide to make your career here? Well, it started when I was on the school board in the Belmont Redwood Shore School District and uh, one of our contractors who provided counseling service to our middle school was FACES, Family and Community Enrichment Services. And the executive director used to come every year to the school board meeting, make a presentation uh, to support the funding. And I really fell in love with the program, and I fell in love with the organization. And when I left the school board after eight years, I was still looking to continue my community service. And I approached the executive director of uh, Family and Community Enrichment Service at that time, and um, I joined the board. I had no idea. I'd never served on a, a nonprofit board, uh, but I really got to understand and learn more and more about the organization. And, and it was just uh, a wonderful relationship. It was a great organization. and. Uh, it just continued on and on and people left and I became the chair and then um, uh, just lasted for 16 years and I enjoyed every minute of it. And, and having served on a, a quasi-government organization, a uh, school board and, and uh, in, in business and in, in nonprofit, how, how would you contrast those types of experiences? Well, I think on a school board you, you realize that and it's the same thing as a nonprofit board. You're there to be an advisor, uh, to oversee. You have a fiduciary responsibility. Uh, big difference then from a day-to-day -day running of the organization. And that's something I've always enjoyed both in the private sector and now in the nonprofit sector. So you, so you see a real distinction in the governance function, which is to provide advice, to, to exercise a fiduciary responsibility. But, the, the, the role of, of a uh, of staff, of the professional staff, is, is substantially different. And, and how does that work as, as, as an advisor? When, when you feel that, that an organization is moving in the wrong direction, what is your role as an advisor? Uh, our role as a, a board, or being a board of trustee on a school district, is to uh, bring that to the attention of either the executive director, or in this case, superintendent on a school board, uh, we experienced that when I first joined the school board uh, in our first, my first term in four years, we had some older board members on there who were basically, they thought they had the uh, authority to run the school district and not the superintendent. And it took us a good three or four years to change the structure of the school board and to change the direction so that we hired a new superintendent and that superintendent understood he had the responsibility for running the school district, not the board. And the board members understood their relationship. And I think that's a, that's a big part of being the difference between a board member and a, you know, a staff. Uh, you have to understand your responsibilities and your limitations. So if the concerns are, are, are strong enough, you can replace your chief executive, but you're not going to, going to reach into the organization and start deciding uh, how things are actually I think managed. that undermines the authority of whoever, the, whether it's a superintendent or the executive director or the CEO. It undermines their authority once you step over that line. So either you're going to direct the head to change the direction, mm -hmm. or you're going to replace the person. And, it, and in a business, it's, it, there's a very simple brief in many respects. It's not that business is simple, but, but the brief is simple. The, the brief is to uh, generate a profit through a ver variety of activities. Uh, to, co to keep costs contained, to uh, maximize revenue, uh, and so on. 
Now, in a nonprofit, you have a, a whole other set of goals. How did you experience that, that transition? Well, it's a big difference. Uh, in my private sector, it was always a question of looking at the bottom line, and that was the most important thing, and every decision that you made almost was based on the bottom line, whether you're gonna spend money, whether you're gonna have to cut staff, reduce expenses, whatever you're gonna do to increase revenue. In a nonprofit organization, I look at it entirely differently. Uh, yes, we have to survive. You can't continue to lose money every year, otherwise you'll have nothing left to uh, run the organization. But there are more important things, the services that we provide. And in some cases, maybe that service, direct service is not profitable. In a private sector, you'd say, shut it down. But when you look at the clientele we're serving and the importance to the community of that kind of service, I look at it in an entirely different light. And uh, in this case, in some cases this year, with the cuts that we've already gone through, I've made a, you know, we've made a decision to continue those services, even though they're not necessarily profitable. And how do you make the distinction between two services, neither of which are going to generate profit because they're not, reven quote, revenue producing, you're not in the revenue producing business, but you have two services. Those services are serving people in need. You don't have the wherewithal to fund both. How, how do you make those, those uh, choices? And, and when you have to extend yourself, how do you make the choice that that is the thing that you're going to extend yourself on? Is it based on, a, on an analysis of community need? Is it, is it based on, on other factors? I think it's, a, uh, it's an analysis based on those, that group of population that we're serving, whether they're being served by someone else, the number of people we're serving. Uh, if you compare two programs and you're serving 100 in one program and 10 in another program, that certainly contributes to the decision of uh, you know, where you're gonna make that cut or what program you're gonna eliminate. Uh, we have gone through a tough year this year, but we've made some decisions and we haven't cut any of our services. Uh, we've asked our staff to take some sacrifices by reducing their benefits without eliminating any services. So I'm very proud of that, that we've been able to accomplish that and the staff has supported it. So in that way, the staff is also contributing to the community. Absolutely, they're all part of it. And they understood that and that's what they felt, that's the direction they wanted to move in. You also reference as part of your decision-making process what other people are doing. This is, again, another distinction between the business world and, and the nonprofit world, perhaps, where in the business world, the competitors are competitors. They're not necessarily uh, people I, uh, imagining Apple and Microsoft uh, collaborating on something is something that, that, that would, I, I, I frankly would have difficulty imagining. Uh, I'm sure it happens in some respects. But, you actually com uh, compete and collaborate with, uh, with others in the community who provide similar services. We absolutely do. Uh, there's a number of organizations in San Mateo County that we partner with on uh, different contracts with the county. Um, and so we're providing the similar services or the same services, but to normally to different populations or different geographical areas. So that's not a decision. But back to the private sector, you know, you're competing with other companies. And sometimes you look and go, well, they're a better company at what they're doing in that particular area. So we're going to give it up and let them take it over, and we'll concentrate on what we're strong in. And I think that's almost a philosophy you need to follow somewhat in a nonprofit sector. If we're doing something well, then you try and maintain those services. If you're someone else in the community is doing it better, let them do it better. And diversifying beyond your capability to manage is also a bad idea. You want to actually have services that are complementary and that from an organizational perspective you can sustain. Absolutely, and we follow our mission and our vision. Uh, we've been approached by a number of organizations or a county to say, you know, we would like you to do this contract or provide these kind of services. And we sit down and we look at it and say, is this within our mission? Is this within what we're doing? And we'll say in some cases, no, we don't want to take it on, even though we're turning down a, a contract for fifty or $100,000. It's just not where our expertise is. So we're not just out there to provide services for any contract that comes along and just the money grabber. So you're not just chasing the dollars? No, we're not chasing the dollars. Unfortunately, in the, pri in the nonprofit sector, the way the contracts come out, you're sort of forced to not chase the dollars, but you're attracted by what the contracts are that are available. Uh, we would love to do certain things, but if there's no money out there, whether it's a private sector, you know, foundations, or whether it's a county government is not willing to fund that, then that's something that we have to look at and say, can we self-fund it? And actually, we've been, that's a, been a, a major 
I guess, uh, vision of the organization for the 16 years that I've been on it is uh, associated with is that is there a program out there that's not being provided by funding from the county or somewhere else and that we could self-fund the program that we really felt was necessary in the community. And this year it finally came down to an opportunity to make that decision. Uh, we had a program, the Children's Place program, that was funded by, uh, substantially funded by the county and they uh, were not able to fund this this year and we made a conscious decision, the board and the staff, to actually go out and try and self-fund it. We've been somewhat successful with that and the program continues. What is the program? It's a children's place. It's a, a program for uh, eight to 12 year olds in the Redwood City Schools, children living in families with addiction. So these children learn to uh, what a safe look place is, how to deal with it, that it's not their fault for what their parents are going through. And then we also run a summer camp for those same youth. So it's a great program and uh, we've highlighted that program over a number of years. In, in this dialogue between the municipality and yourself, uh, in which the municipality has already decided what, what they wish to fund, and you're looking at the, at the need and maybe thinking that, well, the need might be other than what is funded, um, are you able to impact the municipality's decisions around what type of programs they would wish to, to support? Somewhat. Uh, you know, once in a while you can argue a point where the county says, well, we're not sure if we're going to fund it and we can go back to the county and we have a very good relationship with the county so we can go back and sort of convince them that it is a needed program and that there's a lot more to it than what they see. And in some cases they've reversed their decision, they've either extended the funding for another year, but in this case they, you know, after a lot of conversation they just felt they couldn't fund it any longer. Could you give us a, a good overview of, of, of the range of programs that LIFUS provides? We have 23 programs. Um, they range from um, zero all the way up to 21-year-olds uh, in most of our programs. Um, we deal with some adults also. Uh, we break our programs down into early childhood and youth services, uh, and that includes our early uh, learning programs. We work with the First Five Commission of San Mateo. So we do a in-home visiting for uh, working with parents whose children are not in preschool, mm -hmm. preparing both the family and the child for preschool or kindergarten. Uh, we have a uh, healthy homes program which is aimed at uh, children zero to five who experienced domestic violence within the home. So we go in and we counsel the family and work with the child so that that connection or that uh, cycle doesn't continue. Uh, and then we also are one of the leaders in San Mateo County in youth development. So we, have, we are uh, the San Mateo County Youth Commission, which was formed by the Board of Supervisors in 1993. We actually run that program for the board. And that's all based on the youth development and the 41 assets. So that's our early childhood programs. Uh, and then we get into health and behavioral substance abuse. So we're working with uh, young adults who are either involved with substance abuse or mental health problems and we're counseling them and they're either mandated by the courts to attend classes or voluntary. Uh, we also work with women who are not able to get back into the workforce because of drug or some mental health problems. Uh, we have transitional programs that we work with uh, foster care youth for providing transitional housing for them between the time they're emancipated from foster care until they can get on their own and be self-sustaining. And then our uh, other programs are counseling programs in the schools. We have a counseling clinic that we operate in our uh, location. And um, I think that is all of our programs that I can think of. We have a, actually uh, two, we have a homeless uh, shelter for youth. And then we also have the only uh, uh, runaway home in San Mateo County for any youth that are picked up by the police or referred by CPS because they can't stay in the home on a temporary basis. It seems that so many of your programs are focused on, on transformational uh, activities, uh, taking somebody on a journey in which they are uh, no longer reliant on, this, on the system and these services. Um, could you talk a little bit about, about how you view programs because there are an awful lot of different types of programs that are out there but it seems that that you have a particular um, uh, bent uh, at WIFUS. 
Um, and in particular, there seems to be a lot of avoidance of, of incarceration, a lot of avoidance of, of having people living on the street, um, a lot of skills transfers, uh, and so on. Well, I think all of our programs follow our vision, and that is to provide the, these, this group of people, whatever problem they have, with the potential to get to the point where they can self-sustain themselves, whether it's housing, whether it's a mental, his, mental health issue, whether it's getting off substance abuse, um, teaching uh, the emancipated foster care or the foster care youth living skills, financial, how to, you know, how to even shop, how to cook. They, they haven't learned these skills because they've, they've not had the family, family to teach them that. So we're trying to teach them all of these skills so that when they move away from our programs, they can self-sustain themselves and continue to be a part of the, you know, an active part of the community and not be a burden to the community. That's our vision of all of our programs. Do you follow um, the progress of, of people that you serve and, and collect information on the outcomes? Unfortunately, in most cases, we don't. It's very expensive, and most foundations or grants or contracts that we get will not fund that. But we do get quite a few of our uh, youth that come back to the program and sort of check in with us and, you know, tell us what they're up to and that they're back in college or whatever. So that's great success stories, and it's great inspiration for the staff to continue their work. And in terms of your relationships that enable this, this, uh, these services to be provided, um, we've, we've experienced um, the support that you seem to receive from law enforcement, um, from the school districts. Could you talk a little bit about those relationships and how they're forged and how they actually work on a day-to-day on -day basis with your staff and yourself? Well, I think relationships within this business, as probably most businesses, are very important. Uh, you need to be partners with all of these organizations, and we stress that among all of our staff. We're active in outside organizations that are serving the county. We're active on committees, so if there's a committee that's formed by either behavioral health and recovery services or someone else asks for a committee to look at something, we always try and have a staff member or myself participate. We want to be a part of the community. We want to be seen out there as a part of the community and not just someone who's receiving money and providing a service so that we're more of a business than a community partner. And I think the relationships are probably, they've proven very successful for us. Uh, you know, when you go to the county and they respect you and we respect them, it's a much better partnership than if you don't show your face and just come and bill them and apply for a contract. So we've, we've emphasize that you know throughout the agency and all of our staff are participating in community events uh, for example the uh, this is domestic violence awareness month there was a big uh, parade and a uh, function down at the, the county square in Redwood City uh, there were probably 10 booths that were set up from different nonprofit organizations of those 10 five were from youth and family enrichment services so we're a big you know, we want to be seen in the community, we want to be active in the community, we want to participate in the decisions that are being made. In this time where California is suffering a major financial meltdown, the, uh, the nation is, is undergoing some real financial difficulties, there is the, the very strong debate about what we spend money on, and in particular with the deficits growing, that debate can only become more shrill. Uh, where do you come down in terms of California being a reasonably low tax state at this point, um, and you're suffering some of the repercussions of, of, of the, the budget shortfalls that, that California has. Um, as a society, where do you come down in terms of how we should be investing um, our, our uh, funds in these types of services? Well, if we don't invest in them now, this group of population that's got problems, then they're going to continue and they're only going to grow because if you don't serve the families, then the younger children in those families are going to just follow the pattern of their parents. Um, and someone has to take care of these people. You can't ignore them. If you leave them on the street, then either they're going to be picked up by the police departments because the businesses don't want to have homeless people walking the streets. It's going to hurt business. So and our levels of incarceration are already very high and our, our penal system is costing a huge amount of money. Right. 
So what happens to that population? They're going to get picked up by the police. If they have any kind of health problems, police are going to be taken them immediately to the county hospital. Well, the county hospital is the most expensive place you can take those kind of clients. So we're not saving money. We're maybe postponing what we're going to spend. But, and, I, and I see that as the whole budget process up in Sacramento is they're borrowing money from one place to another, but somewhere it's got to be paid back. And if we don't provide money for prevention and intervention, then we're never going to get ahead of the game. We're going to have more and more homeless people. We're going to have more and more families that need food and shelter. We're going to need more health care provided. So um, I'm, I'm opposed to all these cuts that they're trying to initiate into the system because eventually they're going to come back. And do you see strong support for that type of a position in the business community and the, in the people up and down the peninsula that you serve? There's strong support within organizations and nonprofit organizations that are providing the services. Um, I haven't seen a strong support or resistance to you know, the spending the money. I think every city up and down the peninsula, probably up and down the state, is going through the same thing. You know, what are the basic services that we need to provide? Right. And that's all we can afford to provide. And if you want more services, then you are going to have to agree to pay more taxes. And the cities are they're going through with a sales tax, utility tax, some kind of tax to raise the money because they just can't get, they don't have enough support from the state or the counties, and the counties in the same position. They're looking to also, what can they do to raise revenue? And they've tried a few things and they haven't worked or they haven't been passed by the public. So whether the opposition is there now or it's going to come later, I'm, I, don't, I don't get a reading yet. So you don't have any, any magic answer to, to solve the state's fiscal problem? No, I don't have a, I don't think any. I think the state needs to, uh, they need to do a constitutional convention. I think that's the only thing that's going to solve the state problem. They just, they're not functioning up there. Uh, you know, they made some cuts, for example, to domestic violence. They cut out all of the funding. So a lot of the shelters throughout the state closed. They reconvened the legislators. And they've now refunded back 80% of the money they cut but the money was borrowed from some other source, so that's not solving the problem, it's just postponing the pay payment. So it's, it's not a good situation. There's a lot of nonprofit organizations throughout the state that have taken much bigger cuts in funding than we have. We've been very fortunate this year, but the next three years, I believe, are gonna be worse than this year. And what does the future look like for uh, YFAS over the next uh, three to five years? Um, certainly in the short term, it's going to be a, a survival game and, and a matter of continuing to serve um, while the resources diminish. But uh, long term, what do you see uh, YFAS uh, doing going forward in terms of its evolution? I think we'll probably have some kind of uh, retraction over the next three or four years until the economy turns around. But we have a very strong structure in place. We're very strong financially. We have very good reserves. And there's going to be a need for our services, whether it's next year or in four years. There's going to be a greater need. And we continue to grow. We just hit $10 million this year. And uh, that's from up from $6.5 million when we first merged in 2003. So in a short period of time, we've grown considerably, and I think we'll continue to grow. We're not looking to merge with other organizations. We're not looking to uh, absorb any other organizations. We've grown from basically our reputation and the quality of services we're providing. And I think that will prove to be an effective growth rate for us in the future. And the bang for the buck, for that $10 million, the impact on society is substantial. Absolutely. Substantial. Absolutely. We're touching the lives of 30, we estimate 34,000 people a year, and a lot of those people are on the, our suicide uh, prevention hotline and chat rooms that we do with the youth. And um, so those programs will continue. They have to continue. There's a need. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for leading this wonderful organization. Well, I love the organization, and I love leading it. It's a great organization, and I'm so proud of our staff. And, and that's what I find so great about the nonprofit field is that the employees are so dedicated and passionate about what they do and you don't find that I've never found that in the private sector Michael Garb thank you for your insight thank you mark